Thank you. Um, forgive me the title. I tend to write those last in a blind panic. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll talk about something to do with that. Um, really interesting, actually, to hear the session earlier, particularly. I've been in post for only about a year, um, so it is uh, quite heartening to hear a lot of the issues I'm encountering at a unit manager level for the first time are being talked about through years of experience elsewhere in the room. Um, there you go. Uh, so, um, the project I've chosen to talk about today is uh, firstly public money rather than a private developer, and secondly uh, is predetermination rather than conditioned. So um, some of the issues we were talking about before will be relevant, and uh, some of them may be aren't to this project just yet, but may become so, um, and uh, we'll see where that goes. So um, the subject I'm going to talk about is at the village of Skeffling, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, <laughs> So I don't know how clearly you can see that. There's the red box to indicate the East Rising of Yorkshire, um, and then the Google Earth image with some of the major settlements in that region, Bridlington, York, Hull, um, and uh, Skeffling right out here, uh, just before you get to the hook of Spurn Point, with a beautiful view of Grimsby. Um, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting place. Not particularly scenic, um, but uh, plenty of archaeology there. We, have, uh, we were commissioned by the Environment Agency and their um, partner, Associated British Ports, to assist them in the early stages of assessing the area in advance of a proposed coastal realignment project. Um, the ultimate area, which I have to say changed quite a lot in the year or so before we got out onto site, uh, eventually encompassed 430 hectares, um, which is a considerable <coughs> area. Um, and uh, the presented quite a challenge because we had to mobilise our site investigation work alongside the geotechnical work and the site engineers. Um, we were given six weeks to do it um, and the weather wasn't great, uh, which in the clay tills of East Yorkshire can be a bit of a challenge, especially as the light is failing into October, which is when we were out there in 2016. Um, we got it done, um, but uh, yeah, it was interesting. So very briefly, the scheme itself, you can't see that, but mm -hmm. never mind. It's, it's a fairly flat landscape. Okay, I'm sure you probably realise that. Um, they're going to take uh, a new flood bank, about 900 metres in land, up on a slightly higher contour. There'll be new pumping stations, new drainage channels. Um, they're going to do a quite a large amount of ground reduction and then breach the existing flood defences and let the sea come in. Um, and uh, this is very similar. In fact, this leads on from a project that the Environment Agency delivered at Medmary, which is at Chichester, which is just up the coast west of here, some of you may be familiar with. So the um, primary uh, driver for this is to create compensatory habitat for wildlife to uh, mitigate against coastal squeeze. Um, and one of the additional benefits is it will improve the flood defence for this area. Um, you may not recall in 2013, there were serious tidal surges on the east coast. Um, there was flooding from Scarborough down to into uh, the Lincolnshire coast. Um, and some areas of the farmland here were very badly affected. And indeed, are still salt burnt and incapable of supporting a crop. So there's a real issue with, with um, defence as well in this area. Um, so this is uh, primarily for us, we were commissioned through the Environment Agency. Associated British ports have an interest here as well, um, because they obviously own the various major ports in the Humber estuary. Um, and there are development proposals in place for those as well. Um, and so there's an element of land banking going on to try and make sure we've got the replacement habitat in place to allow development and the economic regeneration of the region. So it's, it's, a, it's a big scheme and there's quite a lot of writing on it. So what we were asked to do, um, we were commissioned to essentially undertake an evaluation, but not um, sort of intense, uh, what's the way to put it? a fairly light touch evaluation at this stage. What they wanted to do was get some idea of the character of what they were going to be dealing with. Primarily, they were interested in informing their design so that they could manage their risk. Um, and a critical element of that, which I haven't written on the slide, was engaging very early with the original stakeholders, including the county archaeologist for East Riding, who is Lucy McCarthy at the Humber Archaeological Partnership, um, and also with Historic England, and Natural England, and various other partners, as well as a, a few academics to um, make sure that they had a handle on what they were going to be dealing with as early as possible to make sure they got consent. Um, so that's why we were brought in. So um, entirely predetermination. Uh, pre so the consultation with people like the curator um, was largely to ensure buy-in later down the line to make sure they were starting off on the right foot. Um, and we went out and designed a program uh, which was approved by them and by Historic England. 
uh, to have a look at this landscape. So we undertook about 100 hectares of geophysics, which GSB undertook for us, um, and then we did a number of trial trenches, we did an awful lot of boreholing, um, and we also worked alongside the site of the uh, ground workers there doing their own site investigation, looked at all their logs as well, so we tried to double up on that one. Um, and uh, we also did a series of test bits to try and understand the entire deposit sequence, but accepting that this is going to be a quite broad brush for the moment, to try and then identify further priorities for assessment further down the line, and eventually leading to the scheme itself. Just a little bit of background, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, um, the history of the north of England, um, the area we're talking about, which is here, um, would have been under the ice sheets, um, and uh, then would have, uh, post the glaciation, um, would have essentially been a bit of a tundra um, before things really got going again. What's particularly interesting here, I'm sure many of you are aware of Doggerland, um, but the site itself, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to tell really, um, it's about here, so you know, we're looking at basically an inland coastal plain in the Mesolithic that over a period of about 6,000 years becomes inundated, so it goes from an inland river valley to a coastal estuary. Um, so working with our geo-archaeological colleagues at Trenton Peak, which is one of the sister offices of York Archaeological Trust, we realised very early on that there was potential for good environmental evidence to be um, obtained at depth and there was some value in getting quite a high level of specialist involved early on in order to characterise those and to, to, to help avoid a major showstopper um, further down the line. Um, and we were driven in that very much by the Environment Agency's experience at Med Mary, where um, from a different period, but they encountered archaeological assets rather late in the process that caused them a few problems. So this is what was inspiring their desire to front load some of the evaluation a bit much earlier than they had done before. Um, which I think is quite an interesting idea, and that's why we were involved. Um, some of these slides have a little bit about what we did on our holiday field about them, mm -hmm. so I'll just skip through them. Basically, just to give a very brief, um, obviously happening in the context of a lot of study of this region, particularly the Humber Wetlands Project, um, which we're obviously very aware of. We've been fishing these uh, Mesolithic um, points out of the North Sea for many years, um, and uh, there's been a lot of work in the early prehistoric period in this region. It's quite interesting. If you skip into the Roman period, you'll see that the Romans, <laughs> nothing happens in this region. And you could say that that's persisted ever since. It would be really unfair. Um, the real reason is, of course, as ever, is that nobody's really looked. Um, so there's a clear research gap there. So not only did we have this really important potential Mesolithic and Neolithic story, which you know, came to light in the last 15 years or so, we've also got obvious gaps in what you might consider the more traditional archaeological range um, that we thought might be an opportunity to fill. And of course we're based in York, which is here. We're very well versed with the Roman archaeology of this region. We've spent 45 years digging it, um, so that's just something we can bring as existing experience in the York office, in conjunction with experience in our Trenton Peak office of um, looking at earlier landscapes and deposit them. So, um, also interestingly, East Yorkshire is falling into the sea at a rapid rate of knots. And there are an awful lot of um, medieval settlements that are now under the waves, um, and their hinterlands are not remotely understood. If you go to the HER and look for all the fleet, the radius of potential locations for that place is extremely broad. Um, and uh, particularly a steer we got from historic England was quite a lot of interest in seeing if we could tie that down a bit. Um, I'd like to say we had, we haven't quite yet, but we're aware that that's part of the story. We've also got the mysterious story of Ravens at Odd which is uh, uh, apparently of Anglian origin, so Anglo uh, pre-Scandinavian origin, um, one of the largest ports in the north of England, um, but completely flushed away by the tide by about 1400, um, and now an RSPB burglar zone, currently inaccessible because the road at Kilnsey was breached during the 2013 um, storm surges and has never been rebuilt. Um, so bring you up to date with some of the challenges in this landscape. There is also um, petrified buried forest off the coast here. So there's lots of, in the wider region, lots of interesting stuff going back a very long way. Anywho. So, in summary, um, after we've done that work, which we managed to complete within six weeks, um, we found good evidence for Mesolithic coastal deposits, which is obviously of significant interest. Um, storm events, as envisioned by doing path analysis for different <coughs> deposition processes that allowed you to uh, distinguish between sort of gentle alleviation and quite rapid violent turning over and deposition. And for anyone quizzes me on that, I'm not a geoarchaeologist, mm -hmm. so please. Um, we also had like, significant bands of, of peak formation during the Neolithic period, which is um, perhaps not unexpected, but quite important. 
Um, and a lot of this is coming from the borehole work that we were doing um, and a deposit model that we built. Um, later prehistoric activity was surprisingly scanty um, and really only evidenced by residual material. Um, but we were well aware from the desk-based work that we'd done earlier in the process that there are Iron Age and Bronze Age settlements known from immediately north of the scheme area. Um, and it brings you back to the scale of the work we were doing at this point, which in landscape terms is very small. So we're really only characterising it at this moment. Um, it's a good Roman archaeology, which I'll come on to a little bit later. And we did find a little bit of these um, medieval hinterlands, um, which you know, will allow us to focus further work on those and try and define them more effectively. Um, and perhaps most importantly, underneath the current title defences, we think we've got evidence of earlier ones. So some of the deposits are coming back with a 12th century date, and some of them are coming back with a 7th century date, which is obviously quite interesting. Do we have a buried land surface surviving purely under the original embankment? Do we have anything significant, or do we just have a deposit of soil that happened to be laid in the 7th century? We don't know, clearly. But these were... The Environment Agency was very keen that we flag these potentials up very early so that we can start to factor them into the process so we're not hitting them later on. So, um, picking up from some of the discussions about the process, uh, we, I think, went through six iterations of the project design, um, each with a subtly different, tedious photograph on the cover. Um, and uh, these were trying to build in this concept of assessment all the way through before we even set foot in the ground. So obviously we had access to the LiDAR data sets, this was before they were free, <laughs> but our clients, the Environment Agency, very kindly provided them for us. Um, and our specialists at Trenton Beak and, and also the external geoarchaeological specialists we use, Andy Howard, who I'm sure most of you have come across, um, were involved very early on to help give us a steer, to help us design something that would then go off and characterise these effectively. Um, so we're trying to be reflexive all the way through the process. Um, you'll notice there's a big gap in the middle. So at this stage, they weren't intending to develop that part of the site, and that came in a lot later did cause a few headaches, but we dealt with it. Um, you'll be familiar with LiDAR data, lower ground, higher ground. Very early on flag potential for a tidal inlet in that central area. And when we looked at the final resolution, we began to have a go at mapping some of the paleo channels. And this was my former colleague, Dr. Sam Stein, who was working with David Knight. Both of them have done extensive paleo channel mapping in the Derwent Valley. And so we're drawing on that internal experience to bring some of that knowledge to this site. Um, and again, helped us target some of the further work. It's really quite interesting. These little islands are uh, glacial till poking up out of the alluvium. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the geophysics gave back lovely signals on the till and absolutely bugger all on the alluvium, which shouldn't really be a surprise. Um, but, uh, you know, perhaps says more about the visibility in the landscape than it does about the actual presence of archaeology. So, this is, and oh, you can't see that in this light, I'll have to point at it. Bit of a Roman settlement here. Uh, well, at this stage we assumed it may be a Roman settlement. I've given the game away from when we trenched it. It was indeed a Roman settlement. Some stuff up here, similar settlement there. Good chance they are actually all linked together. And we did a subsequent survey in this field and found more of that one. So we were, before we even set on site, we were aware that we may have buried land surfaces underneath some of the alluvium in some places, and we were able to flag that very early on as a risk. Um, there we go. Uh, we didn't do a complete coverage. Um, the rest of those gaps will be filled in at a later stage. Um, it was very much a case at this point of prioritising uh, certain areas over others to get a basic understanding of the area. So uh, we then peppered it with boreholes and test pits, um, and we did take a large number of samples. Now, someone was saying earlier, I think the, um, the chap from CGMS was saying, that you know, pollens and diatoms should be left well after the assessment process. In this case, it was actually really important to ascertain whether we were in uh, freshwater environments or saltwater environments. So there was a perfectly justifiable reason to do the pollen and diatoms here, um, because it would help characterise which bits of the sites were which, and that's why it was done. Um, ditto with the C14 and the sediment analysis, so that we could actually understand deposition processes to a final level of detail, always acknowledging that the actual sample interval is quite broad in this case. Um, so again, we had our specialists involved while we were actually on site. Both our internal geoarchs and the external labs, we had a uh, constant liaison with them to make sure we were getting the right data for them. Um, I'm working closely with the CH2M, who were the clients, uh, consultants, now Jacobs, um, and Fugro, who were the contractor at the time. Um, so trying at least to uh, take the opportunity to be a little bit more reflective while we were there and make sure what we were generating was useful. 
Uh, very briefly, you've seen pictures like this before, certainly far more interesting. We did also do the traditional trial trenching. We found cut features, as you might expect, very heavily plow uh, truncated. Um, but you know, we did receive quite a nice assemblage of larger Roman pottery. Um, and we did, uh, at the behest of the county archaeologist, and partly because we were already employing him in the context of a different site, get one of the local external specialists, Pete Didsbury, to actually cast his eye over it, just to give us a little bit more of a refined steer um, for these uh, assemblages in this region. Um, and again, that all sets us up. We were talking earlier about making sure your specialists are in train for any future phases of work. Um, you know, he's now quite familiar with the site. He's aware that it may come forward at some point. And so if we ask him in the future, it won't be a nasty surprise. Um, and he'll also have had some sight of the information already, which I hope is going to be useful. Um, we also were able to collect quite a lot of ecofactual data. We were finding um, midden dumps of oyster, which is quite interesting, hinting at some sort of uh, agricultural exploitation of marine resource, which when you think about where it is, shouldn't really be a surprise, but it's a surprisingly underexplored uh, topic in our region. Um, and what was also quite nice is that we demonstrated the geophysics was incredibly accurate in that everywhere we had a sibling, we got a cut feature, which doesn't always happen, as you well know. Um, so it was actually really successful. And um, again, perhaps earlier than you would normally do, uh, we were bringing in uh, mollusk specialists again to give us that finer environmental grain so we could better understand what sort of environment we were talking about. So what was the output? Um, well, we did produce the uh, doorstop assessment report, because we were told to. Um, and it's a fascinating read from cover to cover, and I recommend it to all of you. Um, but what we were also doing, and going back to the beginning of the talk, the, the, the primary objective was to help them manage risk. Um, now, these are the graphic outputs. We produced a GIS, which is the primary output, and that went straight to the client, and they fed that into their design team. Um, but uh, we were able to sort of use a traffic light system to flag up not only where we knew where there was material, and where it was of significance, and perhaps where it wasn't, but also importantly where we didn't have information and where we might need to focus further work in order to refine that data set. So we're trying to assist decision making through our assessment process, I think is what I'm trying to get across. Um, we also at this point were highlighting priorities. The leading edge of Sunk Island has about three metres of post-medieval warp, most of which was laid down in 1870. It's not really a research priority, so we're able to write that off quite quickly. But the reason we looked at it was to ascertain that we didn't have deeply buried mesolithic deposits or indeed sensitive deposits at a higher depth, and we don't. So we've answered that one. Um, so in the sense in which I think that's early assessment doing its job and helping the client identify where they do need to prioritise them perhaps when they don't. Um, so here, we do think we've picked up um, the coastline as it was at a certain point in the mesolithic period. Um, again, it's three or four metres down. Um, so there's a good chance that won't be impacted by the scheme, but nevertheless we know about it. And um, something else really important we were asked to do was identify opportunities for further research, as well as purely to look at mitigation, preservation in situ, and what would need to be dug away. Um, and again, convening the stakeholder group, sharing the results with them, asking them what they felt was important, is now starting to inform the design of the next phase, where we are looking, obviously, at where the scheme is going to impact most heavily. But we're also looking at where we might get some extra dividend out of doing a little bit more work. Partly taking our cue from Historic England and the guidance on preservation um, in situ, and the idea that when you've got an opportunity you want to characterise these things, even if you're not necessarily going to be hitting them with the hole. But of course, if you flood this landscape, which they're proposing to do, you're going to have tidal energy eroding this landscape now for generations to come. And the impact on what's deeper down is completely unknown. Um, and so there is an illness we feel on assessing that properly so that we can at least try and quantify what is there and perhaps then build a model of what might happen to it when they knock down the flood wall and let's see it, which is currently slated for the early 2020s. Uh, so, I hope that was interesting. Um, I tried to do a bit of a reflexive thing. Um, isn't Yorkshire lovely? Uh, <laughs> so um, we felt this worked really well. Um, we were able to successfully integrate quite a lot of complex data sets, which were recovered quite efficiently. Um, we did try, always get it right, but we did try to get our specialists involved as early as we could, while we were at, in fact, before we were retrieving data, to make sure we were retrieving the right kind of thing. Um, with our specialists, you know, we, we, I'm a field archaeologist, I'm not a fine specialist. You know, I always feel the project officer is the one who coordinates the post and the specialists kind of contribute to that. 
that had explained to me differently. That's I'm sure <laughs> some of you will realise. Um, I did have one Roman small fine specialist tell me, um, I won't name them, tell me that they could write my entire site from the residual material and the stratigraphy didn't matter. <laughs> I didn't continue that discussion. Um, and I think we have got a fairly detailed deposit model, given the fact that we had a fairly low sample interval. Um, and we are now engaged in the process of taking it further, which is good. What are the problems? Um, I think there's always a different expectation of what information is required. Um, all the pressures about what the money is actually available for that were covered in great detail before tea, and I'm not going to go back over. Um, I always tear my hair out at formatting. You can send some in the format you want it in. You can come back in something else, um, which leads on to issues with um, deposition of digital archive, which one thing would, like everybody else, we're wrestling with, um, and trying to identify early on what our discard policies will be and what our retention policies may be. Um, so, I've no idea what the time is. I think I've probably said enough. So, um, this is what we've been doing, and this is one way in which we're trying to use the assessment process on behalf of a client to inform decision making and get to a better result. Let's see if we can do it.